Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. My name is André Trottier, I'm from Quebec. So please uh, be patient with my uh, French accent. Um, I am so happy and honored to be here in Alberta, in Calgary. I'll speak a little bit about uh, my uh, relationship with Calgary. For me, it's a special place in my refereeing career. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Volleyball Alberta and my friends Jim in the back and Sean to have me here. I met those great guys working with me in Edmonton last year. It was amazing. So I will try to talk to you about beach, my passion. I'm also a volleyball referee. Uh, and uh, well, volleyball is my passion, like probably all of you. Um, so I'm going to try to try to take you on the sunshine side of, uh, of volleyball. This morning, the, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, refereeing itself on the beach. Uh, what is the difference between volleyball and beach? And also, uh, the second part of the presentation, uh, maybe you're a bit bored with this because you might have quite a few presentations about the psychologi uh, psychological aspect of beach. But uh, the new uh, presentation I made now is, uh, I was two weeks ago or three weeks ago in Dominican Republic giving a, an international referee course. And we had a, a sports psychologist uh, coming to make a presentation, uh, both for volleyball and beach. And this guy was amazing. I had in my career the chance to have a few psychological presentations for refereeing and stuff. But this guy was at a different level. Amazing. And he, he kind of teaches us things that uh, I think is going to be very important for us to, to try to practice and bring in the uh, refereeing uh, kind of uh, mentality now. Different things. So we'll go like that. So I am lucky because I have the chance to be a member of the uh, Volleyball Canada Referee Commission. And I can tell you I have the chance to travel around the world. And in Canada, we have one of the better and the best um, different techniques and uh, learning programs in Canada to develop referees. I'll talk later about international referee course we had uh, throughout the world. And every time we do a course, the Canadian referees are among the top uh, of the group. Why? Because we have great programs in each province with uh, Jim and uh, my friend Jason, and we have Mr. Boris here in Debbie. All those people are senior referees and they have an excellent knowledge to teach us. So, and when we receive you at the top level, we can see that you guys are ready. So we're doing good. I'm also a member of the North Seca Referee Commission. I will talk about the North Seca a little bit. And I had a chance for, I think, 10 years now to be on the FIVB uh, Referee Commission. And now it's, it's called the Referee Commission and the Rules of the Game Commission. So we have merged. Because many years ago, there was two separate commissions. The rules, the guys were making the rules, they were bringing them to the referees, we were making analysis, and then uh, finalize the rules. In the old days, we were 50 people, you know, in those two commissions. And now with the new president, there's only nine people with both commission merged. So it's uh, very different. But what I like is I have the chance to be at the place where the rules are getting born. So when I come back to Canada, and I know we have people who will teach you the rules, okay, the rule 22 Dutch dot one, two, four, whatever. But what I like to teach is the philosophy behind the rule. Because having the chance to sit there with all the VIPs and the president and all those guys, we know what they want to bring to the sport. So I like to teach uh, the philosophy behind the rules. Why do we do this? Why don't we do this anymore? So to help you when you understand the philosophy, it's easier to apply the rule, my opinion. So, and we also have Mr. Guy Bradbury from Canada. Uh, you probably all know him in volleyball, sitting with us at this commission. Very important person. I knew I, I, I broke it. Yeah. Sorry, I break it. Okay. When I say it all started for me in Calgary, uh, so I am very old, okay? So I started refereeing in 1980. So I know it's very, very far away, but I was young. Okay, I was like 15 years old, give me a break. But I, um, this is when I started. And when I started my uh, 
my referee career, uh, I went to the course because, you know, when you start refereeing, most likely it's because you need to get some more money because to, you're at school, so this is why I went. And uh, I went to the course in May because I was you know, just feeding my school. And when uh, at the course, we were four people. And we know, I don't know if it's the same problem in, uh, in Alberta, but in Quebec, it's very difficult to recruit referees. Uh, every year, we're making a lot of clinics, but we lose most of them the next year. So they've decided to give the course even though they had only four people, which I was lucky because if they would have not given that course, I would have probably never ref because if they would have given a course in October or September, probably I would have forgot, moved to something else and never become a referee. So thank God they've decided to do it. So this is my message sometimes, you know, you, you're unsure if you're going to give this course or not because not enough uh, participants you need 15, you have only 10 or 9. You never know who is among the group. You could have the next uh, Canada NOC or the next big superstar in your province or in your region as a referee. Then my national clinic was here in, uh, in Calgary. I believe it's 89, but could be 88 or 90. I don't totally remember. But for me, it was a big shock because, you know, who is here is the national referee or a regional who is going to come to a next course? Okay, so when you go there, you think you're prepared, you think you know the thing. And I must admit that when I was like 25, 26 year old, uh, I had some sort of an attitude. So, which is a good thing as a referee. And then, you know, they're going to mold you to, to become more in, in the mold, to be, become a national referee. But I thought I was ready and everything. But then you, uh, when the, the, uh, the bell rings, it's time for you to shine. Everybody's nervous because now you are evaluated by people you don't know. Because most likely when you go to the level three, regional level, it's in your province. So you know the, the evaluators. But when you come to the national clinic, you have Mr. Boris, you have Debbie, you have uh, all those people that you never met. So it's, uh, it's very difficult. Um, but then, you know, right away, you know how things are going to go after your first match. Because if your first match is a disaster, uh, you know. So then you know and you learn and you, you come into the event. And luckily, I, I passed. The next year, again in Calgary, it was the NTCC, which is a juvenile uh, U18 uh, tournament, very strong level. So I was invited and I come here. And at that tournament, uh, it was like four days, and I got sick, like really sick. And you know me, the people who know me, I'm a kind of a volleyball person and, you know, typically French people. Um, but then I was like really sick, big fever, like so quiet and doing my thing and to go back to the refrigerator lounge and be quiet. And I met a man that probably some of you know, Mr. Denis Pomeroy, uh, very famous uh, former uh, NOC of Canada. And he was the assigner. So he met me, he spoke to me a few times, but I was so sick, to be honest, I just listened to him and thank you very much and just went away. And I believe he found something in me, so this referee has potential. So he noticed me then and he gave me the final and blah, 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 so it was a good tournament. Then after that, um, I, you know, miss, uh, we had a woman named Miss Diane Vandy, who was a very important person in my career. She was the ROC of Quebec but she was also an international candidate at that time, at the same time as Scott McLean. And I remember I was coming to meeting with them and listening to those people talking about the international level and the, the steps they have to go through and how difficult it was and blah, blah, blah. And I was, uh, you know, drinking their, 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 uh, what they were saying because it was so interesting and what is international level. And, and for me, I was told a few years ago uh, before I had no chance ever to become an international volleyball referee because I was too small. Okay, so I was not very happy to hear that, but you know, it is what it is. So, and I was listening to them and then Diane says, okay, Andre, I need to focus on my career and I want you to replace me as the ROC of Quebec. So I said, okay. Honestly, I didn't really want that job because you know, if they offer, ever offer you the job of uh, ROC in a province, I would, think about it before you say yes, but you know, it's up to you. 
Sorry, uh, sorry, Jim. You're there for a while. See the bee? I mean, everybody's so happy you used to. <laughs> True. But we thank you so much for doing the job. So I love Diane so much, and I had so much respect for her. I understood what she meant. Okay, and I said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't think I would do it for 10 years. Okay, I was thinking four years, and you know, get rid of it. But then when you get the job, uh, you, you know, you, you start the program, and you want, you know, to make sure your things go the way you want, and then you have to find a replacement, a one that hopefully will have the same philosophy of you. Because in the old days, and I'm sure it's not like this in this province, but in the old days in Quebec, refereeing was very difficult. Like really, I will not say military like, but almost, you know. I'm the supervisor, I say this is what we're going to do and that's what it is. So the, 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 the process of evaluation was very tough. You know, when you're a referee and you have a bad match, I believe that the last person that you need to give you negative critics and hard critics is the referee supervisor okay so we had that back then and the new generation of referees were all in the same pace like, we don't think it's correct you know it has a good point because it does develop stronger referees and the one who stays there are strong and have stronger personality but also you know we have this now you know psy psychological uh, psychological verbal abuse Right, and we're talking about this in different part of the world. I think we also have that as referee. So if a supervisor verbally abuse you, it's not correct. So we we change that mentality in Quebec, and right now with the new generation, there's no way we can do it. It's impossible. So we've changed it. So I was trying to find a replacement for me after six, seven years, and it took me four years to find one. And I give it to Marc Trudel, it's still the ROC, and I'm very happy that he's still there. In, uh, when was that? Yeah. In 1995, you know, I received a phone call, I'm with my wife, it's in the summer, because I was a beach player playing baseball and golf in the summer. So I received this phone call uh, asking me if I went uh, from Volleyball Canada, if I'd like to become an international beach referee. Had to work in the summer. I said, no, no, summer is for me to play baseball, to play golf, and I'm playing beach. And I know it's hard to believe, but I was not so bad. I was only very bad with the referees, and I'll still apologize to them. I'm very sorry. I was not a nice player. But c'est la vie. Anyway, so in 1996, in the spring, they called me again. Mr. Pomeroy, Andre please, we would like to develop the beach in Canada, na, 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 and we would like to send some people to an international referee course. Would you accept to, to work with us in the summer? And I say yes. And I hang up. And my wife says, the, what's going on? I said, what an idiot. I just said that I'm going to be working in the summer for beach volleyball. Ah, she said, you never know. Maybe it's going to be nice and interesting. Damn, she was right. So, I went to my uh, course, it was in Germany, in Berlin. Then I become international referee. I'll speak about this in my other presentation this afternoon. So I had a, not a bad career. And in 2005, FIVB calls me and says, Andre, you're a good referee, but, the, uh, this always this sentence, da -da -da, but uh, we need help as a referee supervisor. So we would like for you to become a referee delegate and stop referring and uh, when FIVB calls you and asks you something uh, they don't like no for an answer so I said yes and then later I was also an, an FIVB instructor so I'm going to cover those things maybe later in the afternoon so I have those three roles okay who here have been referring on the beach Ah, not so bad. I'm very happy. Good. So, do you find this very different from volleyball? Referring in beach and volleyball, or is it the same? Different, right? So, what are the differences? Every time I travel the world, I'm very lucky, okay? 
And, but I have zero empathy from the people who work with me at the office. Zero empathy. Okay? Because, okay, it's okay, you're going to travel the world and blah, 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 and it's grammar and all those things. Yes, but there is a reality check. So, if I'm going to try to also talk about Canada issues and, and North Seca issues. So, what is the life of a beach volleyball referee in Canada and, and also in North Seca? <laughs> Quite different. So, as we know, beach is an outside port. Okay, so we have weather condition, we have the elements, and we don't ever stop unless it's really thunder and lightning or hurricane. Sometimes we stop, but most of the time we play, right? So the elements are a major factor compared to volleyball, right? Because when you go to volleyball, you get to the gym, everything is there, right? In Canada and in North Seca, Referees are in charge of the court. So basically, especially more in North Seca and even on our provincial tours, referees build the court. Right? You have to maintain the court, you have to build it. I did a few tournaments in North Seca and um, you arrive on the beach, it's a wonderful place, but there is sand, nothing else. So you say, okay, so you get the ref, we're going to build the court. So we have to build the court, make sure it's okay, then we can play. So it's very different on that aspect of the game. We also have to train the court personnel. In volleyball, most likely, referees will train the score because we need to teach the scores. That's OK. Sometimes we're going to train the, um, uh, the wall retrievers, which doesn't take so much time, and sometimes the floor moppers. But in beach, we have the rakers, the court managers, and all the the medical staff, a lot of people to train, and this is your responsibility. Also, in our reality, in Canada, in North Seca, most of the time there is only one referee. So you have to do everything. Uh, maintaining the courts during the game or after the game. Imagine when you're refereeing in North Seca, in uh, Nicaragua, it was not long time ago, and the weather in Fahrenheit is 95 degrees. Very humid. So you're doing 10 matches in one day. Let's say eight, okay? Eight matches and you have to maintain the court, which means raking the court, fixing the net, changing the net height in between sets. So it's tough, it's very tough. And also you have to have a close collaboration with the organizers. Sometimes there is organizing issues and uh, you have to fix them most of the time. So it's glamour. But a lot of work. I know Malcolm spoke about the pre-preparation for a referee in event, right? So as you know, if I'm getting the volleyball uh, side, teams and coaches are working hard to prepare their players. They're practicing a lot. They're doing exercise. They're doing videos. And they're investing a lot of money and, and time. So it's normal that for us, on the referee side, when we get to the match, we are prepared. And it's, guys, I am a supervisor with a little bit of experience. It is so easy for us to see your level of pre-preparation for a match. So easy, okay? And sometimes you're not prepared because you have good reasons. Uh, too much work at the office, uh, some family issues. You could not get well prepared to this match. And it shows. It shows to us, but it shows to the teams too, because it's obvious. So preparation is key. On the beach side, the physical aspect is very important. Honestly, if you're not fit, you cannot survive the week of a tournament, because you're doing six, seven matches a day in 35 uh, Celsius, uh, 35 I don't know, like 90, 90 degrees uh, weather, very humid, so it's very difficult. So you have to be well prepared uh, physically to survive these this, this tough conditions. These are long days and they're outside. And right now on the world tour, we have a new thing that they've discovered. We have discovered lights. Eh? Lights is fun because with lights, we can play longer. And, and of course, we have more spectators at night than we have during the day. I've been telling you that for many years, 
Playing beach volleyball in the morning is stupid. There's nobody. But since we have so many teams, so many matches, and only four courts, we have to start early. But now we have these lights on the center court, so we start at 8 o'clock, be at the venue, and we finish last match at 10 p.m., which in fact finishes at 8, uh, 11 or 11.30. So these are our days. A small day on the beach is 12 hours. This is, for us, a vacation day, only 12 hours. It's most likely 15. Long days. I know Malcolm spoke about uh, how you get prepared to, uh, to the rules. So we have a lot of rules, right? We have the rule book, number one. We have the guidelines, which is more precise. We have the FAQ. We have also, we spoke about the case book. Be honest. Who here has ever read the case book? Here in Volleyball or Beach. You know, this case book is the Bible, right? The Bible of refereeing. Because in the case book, there is a situation, there is a referee decision, and then there's those VIP people in Lausanne say, hey, you know what? We agree with the referee or we don't agree, and then we, they write a lot of things about, you know, what should be done. Case book. Okay? I'm a lucky person. I have a few cases of when I was a referee in the case book, and they say the referee was correct. So I'm very happy. Because okay. <laughs> it's not so fun when you're not like this. But this case book is very important. And now, at the FIVB, uh, we are investing a lot of money in, in uh, the new technology. You've seen the uh, now referees have microphones. Uh, we have the uh, video challenge and many things, right? I'll cover that a bit later in the other uh, presentation this afternoon. But what we also have now is what we call the e-learning platform. And why I'm talking about this is because we have the same in Canada. And Scott, do we, you know, do, you know what I'm talking about, the e-learning? Is it going to be released to all the referees in Canada or just for Ontario? Good. So we are working, there's a group working on that. And I've seen the platform, the Canadian one, and I can compare it to the FIVB one. Again, Canada, we are like light years uh, away from uh, better than the other platform. I am in charge of the e-learning in, uh, in Lausanne, and I'm not, it's okay. But what we have is amazing. So hopefully, if eventually it gets spread out and you're going to be able to use it, it's very nice. Because e-learning is the way of the future, the new generation. You know, have you ever seen a teenager without a phone? It's impossible. Try to take his phone away and you're dead, right? So that's the way to go. But e-learning, and I'm telling this to people who don't really listen to me, but you need to have full-time person doing material. Because, okay, you can collect material from all sources, but to feed it, to make it alive, to make it interesting, and it, it's, it's time-consuming. But... At the FIVB, we have an e-learning platform. This is where the referees get their documents, videos, question of the month, and uh, an exam. Because now we're doing the annual exam online, both for volleyball and beach volleyball, international referees. You have, we send you an email. You receive your email. Jason can talk about this. Uh, we had some issues with the platform, but we're doing our best. And uh, they have to do the exam. And, and, and if they fail the exam, it's, it's a big problem. You guys are so lucky because you have native English speaking people. I am so envious of you. For you, it's easy. For us, it's always difficult. We have to think like that. Imagine the people from Asia, from Eastern Europe. It's so difficult. The, the exam is in English, right? And it's like a machine is correcting it. And it gives, just gives you a, a note. Pass or fail. When you fail, well, there's a process, but you know. So it's, there's good things and bad things. Uh, yeah. At the top level now, in volleyball, there is 2,000 international referees. FIVB. Well, well. Not a 5 but an international referee badge. 
and um, we're using 200 on the wall on the FIVB international competitions. So that's why now we have less international referee courses. If we have time at the end, I can talk to you about this. But so it's very difficult, and it's the same in beach. We have 300 and we're using 60. So what I wrote here is high level uh, referee cannot arrive to an event not well prepared because there is competition, big competition. I know referees who will never receive an FIVB assignment and I have a few referees coming to me and they said, Andre, I would die to receive a nomination. I would kill someone to get one. Okay, so, and, and, and I know that this referee, sorry, will never have one. Never. Because the others are better. And we have also this in, in countries, like you have two, three referees for a country, we have six in one country, two of them will never travel. So as a referee, you know, when you get to a competition, provincial uh, tournament or national, stuff like this, you have to be prepared. I'm saying that you can have a bad day. You can have a bad match. You can have a bad day. You cannot have a bad week. Because you have a bad week, that's it. Too bad. That, that's how it is. This is in Switzerland. It's not a bad place to be a referee at. Okay, game responsibility. I have till 10.20, right? This is my... I'll do my best. Okay. Um, a second referee job is easier on the beach than it is in volleyball. For many reasons, right? We don't have any substitutions. Uh, we don't have a coach yelling at us. We don't have... Uh, uh, rotation to check and all those things, right? But we have interference, which is kind of difficult to judge. I uh, will not get to the rules, but you know, this is one of the most bigger, biggest responsibility of the second referee. But when I'm talking about focus and concentration, you know, I'm, uh, in beach volleyball, many times the rally is are easy, you know. So we get in our routine and there's nothing important, and then bang, something happens. And you miss it because you were, you know, talking, thinking about something else, and you know, maybe enjoying too much the view of, of, of Switzerland, and then you miss it. So we talk later about uh, concentration and being focused. And imagine when you're doing nine matches a day, it's difficult to keep your focus for so long. And again, the players play only one match per day, so they don't know that this is your seventh match. Now they're playing at 8 p.m. This is their match. They continue to play or they lose. They go home. But for you, it's your eighth match and you're tired, right? And then you miss something important and it's bad. First referee. Um, I know it's funny to, to hear for somebody who's never been on the beach, but ball handling is much more difficult in beach than it is in volleyball. Why? Because I don't know really about here in, in, in Alberta, but I know in Quebec we're kind of loose, okay? Because we, I'm hearing, hearing, and hearing the expression keep the ball flying, right? So we, because we want to have longer rallies, more exciting rallies. And we've noticed that because we've changed this rule about bowling a little bit, um, what TV wants is action. And if I go in on the beach side, a beach match will last on the men's an average of 50 minutes. Okay, let's say 45 for the sake of argument, for a two-setter, a three-setter, sorry. But the action is about 10 minutes, but the ball is live. So TV wants more action. So at the games of the Rule Commission, we have to find ways to have longer rallies. So. We cannot really change the rules themselves, but we can change interpretation, um, some guidelines stuff. So we're coming with new words. Uh, the, the older referees will remember we have what we used to call a catch ball. Remember that? Which means nothing. What is a catch ball, right? Well, volleyball is a split of rebound, so the ball did not really rebound. Okay. But when we were thinking about keeping the ball flying, so having more action, we, we 
did not change the rule about hell ball. We changed the wording. And now we call it catch or thrown, which is more bigger, right? Catching a ball, like in baseball, or throwing it, is different than just holding it a little bit. But the message I want to give you is the philosophy behind that, behind that rule. Keep the ball flying. Meaning, don't call little things stupid for nothing. Like the little double, we let go. I mean, I'm talking beach. I don't want to say what you have to do in volleyball. Okay, I'm going to let the major volleyball people do it to give their message. But we want to keep the ball fine. But I'm sure they will agree with this message, though. We don't want the referee to kill the match, right? What we want to remember at the end of the game is the players, the action, the emotion of the match. Not the referee calling a double to kill the game. Or fantastic rally who is killed by the referee for a little catch ball. Right? At the high level in beach volleyball, if you do this, you're dead. We call you a next international referee. That's, what, that's how it is. Okay? But of course, we train you, we teach you, you have experience, so... We want to keep the ball flying. If you have any question or I say something stupid, please interrupt me. Okay, Don't be shy. I've been saying things stupid for a long time. One of the game management in beach volleyball is very important. And I'll say very different than in volleyball. Because I like to remind everybody, for six months I do volleyball. Because my beaches are frozen in Quebec for six months. Um, in volleyball, we have few interaction with the players, the game captain, but very few also in, uh, interaction with the coaches because they're far away. Uh, they have their own responsibility. You know. In beach, we're not supposed to have coaches, but we have now. And sometimes they, they are a pain. So I'm going to talk about this this afternoon. Um, but we have only four players. And the relationship between players and referees are direct. Beach professional players don't keep emotion so much inside. They like to get it out, right? Which is good. I think it's better to just let it out than keep it in your side. My, my sentence is always the same. As a referee, we, enc uh, we encourage emotion. We like emotion in that sport. This is a, an emotional sport. But we do not like aggression. So when emotion transfers to aggression, then you have to manage it. And the managing palette you have is, is, is quite long, right? It's like your gray area, you have to play with it. So it's an important factor. How do you manage it? Well, the better referees, you know, will manage it better. But the number one skill a referee must have to have a good game management, what do you think it is? What is the number one skill that a referee must have, should have, to have a good game management? Confidence is one. Okay. Any other thing? And I'm sure you'll never find it. Because you're, you're speaking it. You're English. Right? But for a Chinese referees to have to explain a, a tough call to American players is hard. I'm French. I had some strange calls that I made in my career that I have to explain to the player and I have to sell it to the player, right? Because I will not change my decision. If it's a judgment call, I won't change it, right? So I have to explain it to them. So I know Malcolm spoke about getting the proper words of the rules. Yes. But, you know, you have to sell it. So English is number one. And of course, the knowledge of the rules is the other one, right? Because if you don't know the rules, how can you explain it to, to the player? Uh, okay. We also have, and this is what I, I found the most difficult in my career, is the match protocol. Again, I, as a guy from Quebec, I am jealous and envying of people from Western Canada. You guys are so good with match protocol. And uh, Scott can probably relate to me. I was so bad with this. Like, my God, tell me you have to do this and this. I hated it. I hate match protocol. Totally hate it. Okay. And, and at the international level, there's so many things. And then you have the TV. And, and then we're supposed to start in minus one, one minute, 10 seconds. 
and then they change it for 55 seconds. So we change protocol all the time. So before your first whistle, you had so many things to, do, to run before the match starts. Then you go to the referee stand where it should be you know, the most important thing, but you're tired because you've done many things before. So this is key now, and at this level, you have to, uh, you have to know this. So I spoke about that. Yeah, so what I want to talk about this slide, okay. In the better world, you know, when we're talking high level, a volleyball referee will have one match per day, right? So he has the whole day to prepare for this match and this and that, da, 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 and then he does his match. In beach volleyball, and that can also apply in volleyball because let's say you go to a national championship and you're doing five, six matches per day. So that also would apply to that. Give you my example. So let's say that you're doing a match on court number three at 10 o'clock in the morning. Russia, USA. You do the match. Everything is perfect. You were fantastic. You call everything little touches, the double, game management, incredible referee. Fantastic. Good for you. But then you have another match on court two at 12 with uh, England and South Africa. You have to start over again because those two teams don't know you, right? So you start all over again. And that's going to be the same at 2 o'clock and 6 o'clock and the next day and the day after. So, even though you did a great match, you start over again. And, and this is for your whole career. Because the next event, we start all over again. The good side of this is, let's say that in the very uh, little eventuality that you had a good, a bad match on court five at 10 o'clock. Very bad. You miss this, you miss that. Your line you just put you in tough situation, whatever. So you have to forget it because you start over again at 12. So I put golf thinking. I don't know if you play golf. If you play golf, right, and you make like, you know, a hole-in-one or like this amazing par five in two, whatever, good for you. But you know what? The next hole doesn't know that. It doesn't care for that. You start over again. Okay? So my message is don't be too hard on yourself. Okay? You had a bad match. You know it. You know, well, first of all, the teams told you right, right away. Coaches told you. The players told you. The crowd told you, right? And then, most likely, the supervisor told you too. So everybody told you, you know. So if you are too hard on yourself, and I'm bad, and I, I don't belong here, and all those things, you should stop referring. This is not your job, right? Because bad matches will happen. Bad day will happen, okay? Hopefully not too often. Okay. Before I start to the next presentation, um, the psychological aspect. Any any question? Not too boring? It's okay? I know. If you can survive the accent, you're okay. Okay, let's go with this one now. So, this one is an adaptation of the psychological presentation I had in Dominican Republic two weeks ago. Uh, so please, uh, I did not have time to send it to a friend of mine who speaks uh, better English than me, so it's possible that there's a few words that are not good. So, so basically, what is refereeing? Okay, what is the the psychological aspect of refereeing is that a referee will see an action, something happen, make an analysis, and make a decision, right? This is what we do. Bing, bang, bang, right? We see something, we judge it, and we make a decision. This is very quick, very fast, and you don't have time to say, hmm, yeah, was it double or not? Because to do, do, do. <laughs> Three rallies after, it's too late to make the call, okay? So, perception, interpretation, decision making. We talk about 
I'm going to put all the slides in. Somebody told us about self-confidence, right? When we make a decision, right? Okay, so something happened, we saw it, and we make a decision. So self-control and self-confidence are key elements in the performance of a referee. I know Malcolm spoke. I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, body language. Body language is also key for a referee, right? When I was a player, I was quite good, I will say, to analyze the body language of the referee. I know if this referee or her is about to choke or we can influence her or not, okay? So I hated those referees or like, you know, compose and relax. You could not really get into them. I hated them. On the beach side, we're lucky because we have a hat and sunglasses, right? Many times in my career, I'm in situation, you saw a few slides, you know, when I was in Russia doing the funnel, those things, my God, inside your, ooh, right? It's, it's tough. Refereeing is difficult because we make decisions on every action. I'm so jealous of those, you know, athletic referees who their job is a big competition. You just measure, you know, they throw the thing and you just measure it or things like this. It's not, not difficult. For us, it's tough. So self-control. You have to control your stress and activity, anxiety. Many referees are anxious. Self-confidence, attention and concentration. I'm going to speak a little bit about concentration a bit after. Communication is key. Since I'm talking about that, communication is key. And I believe, I am one who believes that we should have a better communication with the participants. Sometimes we see referees like, I don't want to talk to you. This is wrong. You should talk to them. Because if you uh, put the fire off now, it will not get bigger later. So, Captain, what do you want? Come here. Blah, blah, blah. Then you, you explain your decision. Okay? In a polite, sometimes clear and firm way if you have to. But please be open for them to come to you. We're going to talk a little bit about motivation because, you know, so how many times you've been asked that question? Why do you ref? Why do you do this job? You're nuts. Getting yelled in front of all those people. Why? For $70 a day? A, a match? Anyway. So why do we do this? I'm still looking for that answer. I haven't found it yet. Okay. Of course, if you are refereeing and you're refereeing for a long time, like the old, old, old people we have in the back, it's because you enjoy it. So you have satisfaction with being friends and stuff, you know. It's also a, a personal performance, but a personal challenge. You know, when you do your first regional final as a level one of level two referees, your first provincial final as a level two or three, your first national final as a level four referees, and then if you're lucky enough or stupid enough to continue a long time and then you go to the international scene and you do your first final, it is something, something important. Okay, so you get satisfaction, personal uh, satisfaction. Your personality and also economic and social benefits because when you're a younger referee, you need this money to, to pay your, uh, uh, your studies and stuff. So it's also one of the things. I love this picture. Do a free gets burned? Yes. So, to be a referee it is stressful. Okay, we have referees, especially like I can see referees at the end of their career, they say, you know, Andre, I don't want the big matches. No, not anymore. I don't want to do this, this Pascal Clement or this coach from, I will not name coach from the West because some could be around, but you know, I don't want to be there of this coach anymore, right? It's okay, but it's a sign, right? When a referee goes to you and says, I don't want to do these matches anymore, okay. This referee, either I need him to continue because he's young in his career, so we need, we need to work something with him, or he has reached this level that, you know, he had it, enough critique, he could be just second referee or stuff like this. So we have to accept that too. Also, we have referees that we're going to lose because they're doing only the 
lower level matches. So as a referee uh, uh, in charge of referees in your province or as an assigner, you have to be careful on how you assign your referees if you don't want to lose them. Okay, there are many factors that will make you getting near to the burnout or the choke level. And so, you know them. I'm going to show you a few of them. But how do you get out of it? It is not possible that any of you in your career, when in a match, you did not reach the level or you are really uncomfortable. Okay? And you make that call and you keep it in your head, keep it in your head, and it, your match is, is getting bad. So what can you do to get some relaxa relaxation? The guy, you know, spoke a lot about breathe control. This is something we never touch in our clinic, right? Are we ever teaching referees how to breathe? Never. Maybe in the West, but in, in, in the East, we never done that. Breathing technique. According to this guy, who is a, a, an expert in psychology, okay? And he was think, t saying about five breaths, which you cannot really do on the referee standing. If you go like this, it's possible. I can say, oh my God, if I'm a player, you're doing this to me, you're dead. Okay, okay. so you have to find a way, right? I was pretty good with visualization, okay? You have to visualize something positive, okay? In beach, it's kind of easy to have a good visualization because you're, you have, you're either have beautiful athletes or you're in a beautiful place. And positive thinking, if you start say, oh, but I'm bad. I... Scott told me that I am so bad, and then again I'm doing this, and the coach doesn't like me. So if you start to have negative thought, and you're going to lose control. Is it 20 or 25? 20, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is a slide that he made, but I have done something like this before, just for you to know, okay? This is your optimal performance, okay? So if you go over, you're going to choke. When you're too low, right? And this is typically for beach volleyball referees because too low, you could be like 10 minutes in a beach match and nothing happened. You just go and bing, bang, bang, pow, and you go like this, okay? Then you're so relaxed, and then something happens, difficult, tough, you miss it, players get upset, and you go all the way up in the curve, right? And if you get too high, then you can lose focus, concentration, and you can go to the choke. I have seen in my career scores and referees to choke, in volleyball especially, and seeing a referee who chokes as the first referee, it's tough, and it's tough for everybody. It's tough for us, it's tough for the referee, it's tough for the coaches, because they've noticed that something is wrong. Okay, so I'll go quickly, okay? Just one slide that I really want to show you. This is what you can do. Breathe and negative thoughts and stuff like this. Okay. So, the last slide, okay? Concentration. A thing that we, we never teach that, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. But we never teach our referees the importance of focus and concentration. One thing, okay, thank you, Andre, but how do we improve focus and concentration? Because, you know, as a referee, as a first ref, ball handling is difficult, game management is difficult, and the other thing is very difficult is play at the net, okay? Quick, fast action. So this is where a referee has to be so focused on the touches, on the touch of the net or ball in or out, right? So how do we improve it? And this is my last slide. So, look at the glasses he has. Okay, so the glasses he has can get it can get clearer or darker as you want and this thing is for when you see a light you go like this okay so it's focus 
eyes and hand coordination, okay? And the better you are, uh, he was showing us what he does with his players, his athletes. This is slow motion, okay? For the athletes, and they have to, and they have to do it. And the number of hits is, is uh, the, better, the, the, the better hits you have, the, the, the more you have, the better you are. And he was also in showing us what you can practice. This is my last message. Okay, you have to have an eye and hand coordination, okay? Would be the same with eye and ball coordination, okay? So what he was doing, so he was taking two or three tennis balls, right? You go to the wall and you go like this, do 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 okay? And then the faster you go, the better your coordination is going to get. And then at the end, he was giving the glasses to the referee, and now it gets dark. Okay, so it's more difficult. The other exercise that you need to be two to, uh, two to do, he was, so you have the ball, you're juggling with two balls, okay? And then he throws you something, and you have to catch it. And it was like some sort of a, a cross thing, right? With different colors, four different colors. So when he's throwing you the thing, you need to catch on the white side, on the blue side, or whatever. So it's even more difficult. So these are not very expensive exercise that you can practice to improve your focus, concentration, and uh, eye and hand coordination. So that would be a thing you can practice. And according to him, it makes wonder to wear free because you're, you're going to see uh, clear uh, better uh, the ball or the touches and stuff like this. So that will be the end of my long presentation. Sorry. Any questions? Thank you very much. Oh. Wait, what? Back one slide. This one or? That one? So these are yeah ways to calm yourself. I tell you me what was the best for me was to focus on something positive. Okay, I'll give you my secret. I'm sorry if I'm going to offend some people, but like I said, on the beach side, it's uh you know it's easy to find something beautiful to look at. So this is what I was doing, trying to find something beautiful and look at it. Could be a, a human or a, an object. Okay. Why well, you know I'm French, I'm sorry. Questions? Thank you very much. Oh Thanks Andre. I put that into practice for a little drill with the ball. In the meantime, that's great. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Thank you very much. Thank you.